So let's open with a word of prayer. Oh, let me change my background here. We got Cindy there? Yes, Cindy is here. Hello, Hello. Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Hi, Bill. Hello. Diane's here today. Oh, hi, Diane. Hi. And is, and Jackie's there, and who Jackie else? Jackie Darlis is here. Darlis. All kinds of folks are here. All right. Go with that background, I guess. What happened to my nun background? Hmm. Very interesting. <laughs> Well, I'll be on the beach today. Okay. <laughs> the beach. It looks inviting. I know I one one Zoom meeting that I had with Christy. I'm like, oh, you were at, you're at the same beach that Dave was at. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's start with a word of prayer and we'll get going. Lord, we give you thanks for the beauty of this day, for your joys that are made new every day. And we even give thanks in the midst of difficult times, knowing that you continue to stand with us and guide us and keep us. Help this to be a time of renewal and growth as we study together as your people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here we are, end of Lamentations. Um, before we get started, does anybody uh, have anything they want to? We could share, we could all look at Bill's piece that uh, yeah. he brought us. This is kind of a good introduction. Um, this is from, the name of the book is... Listening. Listening to Your Life. Okay, by Frederick Beekner. So, uh, incredible preacher, theologian, writer. He did a lot during his life that was really incredible. Um, so he starts out with the three propositions I, told, I talked about last time that are hard to hold in tension. God is all powerful. God is all good and terrible things happen. You know, those things don't seem to fit together very well. Um, you can reconcile any two of these propositions with each other, but you can't reconcile all three. The problem of evil is perhaps the greatest single problem for religious faith. There have been numerous theological and philosophical attempts to solve it, but when it comes down to the reality of evil itself, they are none of them worth much. When a child is raped and murdered, the parents are not apt to take much comfort from the explanation that since God wants man to love him, man must be free to love or not to love, and thus free to rape and murder a child if he takes a notion to. Christian science solves the problem of evil by saying that it doesn't exist except as an illusion of mortal mind. Buddhism solves it in terms of reincarnation and an inexorable law of cause and effect, whereby the raped child is merely reaping the consequences of evil deeds that committed in another life. Christianity, on the other hand, ultimately offers no theoretical solution at all. It merely points to the cross and says that, practically speaking, there is no evil so dark and so obscene, not even this, but that God can turn it to good. Jackie, shaking your head no. That last, <laughs> that God can turn it to good, you know, just in the fact that it, a young child, you know, the example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I, that is an unfortunate phrasing, I think. I think what he was trying to say was what Paul says in the eighth chapter of Romans, that all things work for good for those who love God. And what Paul was saying there was not that these things can be made to be good, but out of them, God can lead people to find new realities and strength in the midst of it, and, that's, and thus bring good out of it. So... It's not turned to good, <laughs> but good can arise in the midst of it. So a uh, kind of easier example to kind of process is um, when my mom died, it was awful. And there was no way to say that that wasn't awful. You know, we grieved, we hurt. And yet in the midst of that, we were lifted up by lots of people who were there and loved us and cared for us. So in the midst of that really awful moment in time, God was still at work offering goodness in the midst of it through those people who embraced us and surrounded us and loved us at the time. I think that's more what Beekner is trying to say. There's no, there's no darkness. There's no evil so awful that the light of God can't shine into that moment, that there's not going to be some moment in which the goodness of God beams its way through that really terrible moment to, uh, to bring us hope and strength. I think that's kind of what he was trying to say. He, you're right. The wording is not <laughs> probably the best in the world. You probably 
like I have memories of various situations. I, I'm thinking of the Amish children in the school out in Pennsylvania, was it, who were killed by a younger person who just came in during the school period. And of course, the Amish community uh, rallied behind the families, but forgave the shooter. It's, uh, that's, that's light. And I saw the mother of uh, Jacob Blake speaking to the uh, community uh, the day after this shooting. And she was definitely a woman that wanted peace and wanted it calm. She, I, I think the parents are divorced. I think I read that somewhere along the way, but, but she, she was, there was a light shining yet in the midst of her son's death. I could see it in a way that you don't always see it after mm. killing like that. Yeah. Uh, so, so I and I, but I, so I understand a little bit more. Thank you for what you said. Mm. Yeah. You know, because I could I see know. Jackie's point. I, but sometimes, you know, things are so awful. Yeah. And then, it, if a Christian comes along, yes, but God will turn it to good. Wow! <laughs> just you're done. Get yeah. Out, you know. Yeah, and that's the same as, you know, and he talked about, I think, in this, that some people say, well, it's all an illusion. We think it, it's bad, but it's not. That's that's equally one I can't no. run with. <laughs> you know, bad is happening, and it's not somehow leading to some, you know, not meant to lead to some greater good. No, that's not, that's not the way it is. But in the midst of that, God can still act well, I think and move. What, and, what you say, you know, just... You and your family are in my prayers and mm. and leave it at that. Yep. That's don't come up with an explanation or yeah. David, I know you've used the, this illustration. I think probably I I remember it. Um, it was uh, after the uh, all of the uh, hanging of Nazis mm. and uh, somebody saying, "Where's God in all this?" Mm. That's from He's uh, hanging there. Yeah, it's from Ellie Wassell's book. Ellie um, Wassell night. Yeah. Um, he talks about that uh, uh, there was an execution of a young boy among, along with a bunch of other prisoners in a Nazi prison camp because he did something really innocuous like steal a piece of bread or something, but they decided they were going to execute him. And people in the crowd were going, you know, just horrified by this, of the prisoners who were there saying, you know, where is God? And then Ellie says, from the back, you heard a voice say, up there with the boy. Um, yeah. That's that's, true too. that's that's the kind of understanding we have of reality that we're not somehow separated from God by these awful things, but that God remains with us in the midst of that. And in that, it doesn't take away the pain. Does it? No, no, it doesn't. Uh, and it, uh, you know, that's where we have to be careful because we're, and we talked a little bit about this in some of the earlier stuff about talking about lamentations that. We as a people are uncomfortable with pain. We're uncomfortable with grief. We're uncomfortable with all these negative things. That's why, at least this is why I, nobody's ever told me this, but I noticed in doing funerals that it used to be, they would dig the hole and the dirt would be right there. And in fact, people who were at the funeral would, you know, throw a yes. handful in or whatever. Now the dirt's like, what? somewhere because people don't want to deal with the reality of the finality of it all or the, the darkness of what's happening or whatever. So we, in many ways, have sanitized the reality. Um, in fact, in um, the book I've been quoting throughout this, um, God in the Pandemic, he talked about that now we've moved from having funeral services to celebration services. So we don't want to acknowledge the, the darkness, the, the finality, the, the pain. Instead, we just want to go to celebration. And I think he's overstating that some. But there is a sense in, again, of, in which, again, we want to move past the dark stuff. We don't want to. But he argues, and I think he's right, that you can't really move forward unless you engage, unless you face the darkness to a certain extent and realize that you can move beyond it. You can't just 
make this jump. In Christianity, for a long time, we've struggled with it. And there are a lot of people who don't want to deal with Good Friday. Oh, Good Friday is just too dark. They just want to go to Easter. <laughs> well, you can't get to Easter if you're not going to go to Good Friday. And in the same way, we can't get to new life beyond the, the pain and suffering of grief and, and lamentation if we don't engage that and then move into the new life that's beyond it. And I think there's a truth in that that we really um, we really need to come to grips with as a people. We we have a lot of denial of death in um, in Western culture. We we you know people don't want to age; they want to look young forever. So we do all kinds of crazy stuff so that we can avoid the <laughs> shadow of age and death. We. You know, there's just so much of it that we deny within uh, Western culture. And so I think it's especially good in our culture sometimes to engage books like Lamentations and say, no, you know, you can't, you can't ignore the reality that there is darkness and pain in the world. It's only when we acknowledge that, that we, first of all, can deal with the emotions within ourselves. And secondly, you can't really deal with the brokenness of the world and try to make it better unless you first recognize the reality that it's there. I mean, you can't. Uh, and I've had debates like this where I talk about my struggles with some of the evil in the world around us in our, in our country and the way that we do things. And people say, no, we have the best, you know, there's nothing wrong. This is, well, you can't do anything <laughs> if you're running around saying, well, it's just the way it's supposed to be. You know, you just, you can't engage it then. You can't make a a difference in it. Well, I do want to get to the last couple of chapters so we at least can say, we got all the way through Lamentations. Amen. Uh, Amen. <laughs> so um, I'll read chapter four for you. You can all listen a bit to what's here and then um, we can talk a little bit about it. chapter four. How the gold has grown dim, how the pure gold has changed. The sacred stones lie scattered at the head of every street. The precious children of Zion worth their weight in fine gold, how they are reckoned as earthen pots, the work of a potter's hand. Even the jackals offer the breast and nurse their young, but my people has become cruel, like the ostrich in the wilderness. And that particular phrasing, just so you know, um, the kind of understanding of that time is ultra ostriches treated their young kind of badly. <laughs> and so, um, the tongue of the infant sticks to the roof of its mouth for thirst. The children beg for food, but no one gives them anything. Those who feasted on delicacies perish in the streets. Those who were brought up in purple cling to ash heaps. For the, for, for the chastisement of my people has been greater than the punishment of Sodom, which was overthrown in a moment, though no hand was laid on it. Her princes were purer than snow, whiter than milk. Their bodies were more ruddy than coral, their hair like sapphire. Now their visage is blacker than soot. They are not recognized in the streets. Their skin has shriveled on their bones. It has become as dry as wood. Happy were, happier were those pierced by the sword than those pierced by hunger, whose life drains away deprived of the produce of the field. The hands of compassionate women, women have boiled their own children. They became their food in the destruction of my people. The Lord gave full vent to his wrath. He poured out his hot anger and kindled a fire in Zion that consumed its foundations. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the inhabitants of the world, that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. It was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquity of her priests, who shed the blood of the righteous in the midst of her. Blindly they wandered through the streets, so defiled with blood that no one was able to touch their garments. Away, unclean people shouted at them. Away, away, do not touch. So they became fugitives and wanderers. It was said among the nations, they shall stay here no longer. The Lord himself has scattered them. He will regard them no more. No honor was shown to the priests, no favor to the elders. Our eyes failed ever watching vainly for hope. 
We were watching eagerly for a nation that could not save. They dogged our steps so that we could not walk in our streets. Our end drew near, our days were numbered, for our end has come. Our pursuers were swifter than the eagles in the heavens. They chased us on the mountains. They lay in wait for us in the wilderness. The Lord's anointed, the breath of our life was taken in their pits. The one of whom we said, under his shadow, we shall live among the nations. Rejoice, be glad, O daughter Edom, you that live in the land of Uz. But to you also the cup shall pass. You shall become drunk and strip yourself bare. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer, but your iniquity, O daughter Edom, he will punish, he will uncover your sins. Like somebody's lamenting back yonder. Yeah, <laughs> That's a pro pro protest movement. <laughs> Sound effects. <laughs> it's a protest movement. <laughs> so what do you hear in this? chapter what strikes you what uh well it sounds like they're going backwards they kind of uh in chapter three they got it so that god just doesn't desert you and all of a sudden woo, we're right zooming <laughs> back to the beginning scenes it's a good observation and so why is that in this so we have the first two chapters which are you know pretty fierce laments. We get to chapter three. It starts out kind of rough, but then we move into this moment of saying, but God hasn't forgotten us. God will, you know, save and come and enter in. And now we go back <laughs> to where we were. What is the point of this? Remember, I, I talk some about Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry is... Is this an acrostic? This, this is still an acrostic. Is four is three, acrostic. Three lines? Two, uh, two lines. Um, what it is, is each segment is a letter of the alphabet. starts with right. a letter of the alphabet. That's what the acrostic is. So that's why there's um, 22, 22 little segments, because... So this is up. poetry. Right. But the whole book is also a poetic structure in some ways. Remember that a lot of times what you'll have within um, Hebrew poetic structure is A, B, then C will be the very center of what you're talking about. So you've got A, B, then C, which shifts some, but gives us the center, and then B, A again. So by putting chapter three as the center of the book, and really the end of chapter three, as the, in some ways, this, the kind of pinnacle of chapter three, it places at the very center of the book the most important point, which is in the midst of all this crying out, God is still present with us and will save us. So what, we're, what you, you kind of are now returning to what you did at the beginning, having passed, passed that central point of view. Um, and it's also a way of saying that though we believe God will be there in the midst of this. Doesn't stop that right now is just it's, pitifully it's awful. <laughs> yeah, then, there's a little bit of that, yeah. If this is poetry, I'm just thinking to myself that the poet goes deep. Mm. He's not necessarily, or she, a historian. Mm. They, they critique culture and it's almost as if He's saying our situation, or she, that it's analogous to a woman boiling her own children. Well, actually, unless this we know this is a more than poetry. Yep. This is a lot of people argue that this some of these descriptions are more than than poetry. I'm but not we, arguing that. Yeah. I'm just thinking that poetry can be. Yeah. I, Kind of the sense that some of the stuff I read is, is that this particular chapter is a description of the aftermath of war. So when war ends, what you have is starvation, collapse of social structures. Um, the poet especially seems to draw attention to the, to the children who are 
you know, innocent children in the midst of war are left in brutal situations. That's just the reality um, of what what's going on. And that, strangely enough, the other thing that this particular chapter seems to highlight is that it's especially hard for people who have been rich and pampered and taken care of. When all this comes down, they have no idea what to do. I mean, they haven't had to scrabble for their life before and suddenly they're thrown out into the street and they have no idea um, what to do once they're out there. So maybe the last ch verse, ch uh, verse 22, where it says, he will keep you in exile no longer. Maybe it indicates the latter part of the whole experience of exile. It's certainly possible that, that, yeah, this- It's reach bottom or something like uh, that. Okay. This is it. Um, though there's also an element of what the person's saying as we get to the very end of the chapter is that we're getting our punishment. We have been, brutally punished for what we have done. But Edom, just wait, you think you're in yeah. <laughs> the clear. Um, what is there about Edom? What, what is, um, I know it's, Edom is it's like near, one of Israel's, it's a reality near there. Yeah, uh, uh, Israel's Geometry. neighbor. And what happened was they didn't necessarily participate in the war itself, but they were very quick to, um, Take advantage, advantage. Oh. of the war. Okay. Take advantage of seizing property, seizing things around them. Um, um, kind of kicking Israel while they were down. <laughs> um, yeah, and so, looting now. Yeah, you know, it can be that way, or or more. It would be even more. Um, somebody follows along behind an army that's um, that's sacked some country and they go in afterwards and then they take everything they want. I mean, the looting is more kind of, they're taking advantage of a situation, but not of the fact that people are already down and out. And so now we're going to come in and just make it even worse for them um, and take over their land and take over their possessions and uh, kill the people who are left. Uh, because now it's not even war anymore. Now it's just <laughs> free for all. yeah, free for all for everybody after it's all over. And so um, what the, the poet is saying is that these people who are doing this, they're get, they'll get theirs too, you know. We are getting ours right now. And we know that you know, probably in some ways we deserve this, but you know, it's coming for, for everybody else who's been a part of this too. Um, one of the interesting things is, I mean, this is a powerful and painful description of what happens after the war, you know, what war brings into being. Why is it, why are we so crazy then that we keep fighting wars? We know what's gonna happen. We know the evil that follows on any conflict like this. And yet we, still continue to choose war as a primary way to deal with our problems. I mean, it just, it bothers the mind. <laughs> um, to me, this is kind of a statement of the fact that, you know, there are no winners in the war. Um, well, this is not a war, this is a takeover. Yeah. There was nobody fighting against the Babylonians per se to stop them, nor was there anybody to stop the Soviet Union taking over a couple of countries in Europe, um, Nazis, although we went to war with them. And now the Chinese are just slowly invading and the same thing. So it's not war. This, this is occupation takeover, greed. Mm. And I'm almost loath to say this. <laughs> yeah, I want yeah, to get myself in trouble so often. Um, I think that that's true, but I think one of the things we miss is that we as a country have done the essentially thing. the same thing. Yeah. yeah. 
when we went in, I mean, and this is my opinion. So this is open to debate by whoever would, you know, I just have my sense of history, but it's essentially what we did in Iraq. <laughs> we went in there and we said, well, you know, we don't like the way they're doing things. So we're going in, we're taking over. We're, you know, going to oust the people who've been there before. It created incredible hardship for the people who were there. And I'm not, and I, at least as a person, can't say why in the why in the world we were doing this. It wasn't like they were threatening our national security or whatever. <laughs> we just decided that you know this is what we were gonna. Yeah, the race we've gone into, like in Eisenhower's time, it was like an John Foster Dulles. If you weren't for the United States, you were communist. Mm -hmm. And so we actually went out to South America and staged a revolution so we could go into that yep. country. And essentially, they just had a movie come out about it. That's essentially what also happened in Iran when the Shah took over. Um, we, along with the English, destabilized their government so that we could then enter in um, kind of, in essence, take over and put the Shah in place as kind of our puppet sort of reality so that we could, we could control the country. Um, other people would describe it differently. That's my description, <laughs> yearly. Historians could all argue with me, but- um, Nobody's gonna argue here. I, I just wanted, I, I throw that out mainly because I also want us to realize that this is not other people. This is a human condition. For some reason, the human condition is that we think that wars solve problems. But I, when I read books like Lamentation, I have to say, is this what, you know, this is what we create when that's the solution we take. I mean, it's all, this is always the aftermath of war. People who are hungry and poor and children who are dead and you know, people who have lost their entire life. You know, that's the essence of what war brings. There's, um, there's a sentence here in our commentary, David, in this one, mm -hmm. on the bottom of page 1150, one sentence. Political and religious leaders are guilty of dereliction of duty. Yep. Does that sound like today? I, you know, it does to me. Yeah. <laughs> Not just the president, but others. I mean, our Congress. Well, I think, you know, what the, the person of Lamentations wants us to realize is that in essence, when terrible things happen, and they do everywhere, you know, whether it's here or there, or wherever in the universe, um, Everybody is responsible. Somehow we all help create the reality that surrounds us. That's, but people who have an inordinate amount of responsibility are the ones who have the most power because they could do something about it. They could have done something differently. So the person who's writing Lamentation says, you know, the ones who really got us into this mess, it was the priests and the kings and the people who who wielded the power, if they had done differently, we wouldn't be in this situation and God is gonna hold them especially accountable. Um, which is, is uh, it's frightening to think about that because all of us in some ways end up was with having power and that means but that when you have power, you're accountable for that power. Judah was a small nation, right? In compared to Babylon. Oh yeah, compared to Babylon, it was population and wealth and yeah. power yep. and influence. Yep. So it was David versus Goliath. Yep. Well, but again, part of what you know, and it's again reflected in this particular chapter in, in Lamentations. If you read, um, let's see, I got to find it again here. Um, uh, da, 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 da. The kings of the earth did not, this is starting verse 12. The kings of the earth did not believe, nor did any of the inhabitants of the world that foe or enemy could enter the gates of Jerusalem. It was for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests who has shed the blood of the righteous in the midst of her blind, uh, that wasn't really the place I wanted. Let's see. Um, oh, 
Verse 17, our eyes failed ever watching vainly for help. We were watching eagerly for a nation that would come and that could not save. So what it's referring to is that part of, you know, Judah is small compared to Babylon, but they didn't want to be under the control of Babylon. So what did they do? Built the gate. Well, and the walls of Jerusalem are always kind of there. So that's, yes. they made alliances. Oh, yeah. With Egypt, um, with yeah. other countries to come and get them out of this. Uh, Assyria? Um, who had Israel? Who, who invaded Israel? Um, well, the, yeah, they, 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 they didn't come down to Judah. Assyria was probably gone by this time, but they probably made uh, uh, alliances with Egypt, maybe with Syria, with. Um, with other countries that were around them. So we'll hold off the Babylonians by getting all kinds of people to come here and fight with us. We will, you know. So it wasn't just, oh, we little Judah, it's David against Goliath. It's let's go and get some other people and we can all go and take on the Babylon, which turned out to be a disaster <laughs> that didn't work. Um, and then the Babylonians came through and said, well, if you're going to rebel against us, then we're just going to crush you like ants. And that's essentially what they did. Um, and it wasn't until Persia came through and took out the Babylonians that they got to go back then to Israel and try to rebuild. Um, let's then uh, look at the last chapter here. So we get all the chapters in. I have to watch my clock here too. I didn't wear my watch. Remember, O oh Lord, what has befallen us. Look and see our disgrace. Our inheritance has been turned over to strangers, our homes to aliens. We've become orphans, fatherless. Our mothers are like widows. We must pay for the water we drink. The wood we get must be brought. With a yoke on our necks, we are hard driven. We are weary. We are given no rest. We have made a pact with Egypt and Assyria to get enough bread. Our ancestors sinned. They are no more and we bear their iniquities. Slaves rule over us. There is no one to deliver us from their hand. We get, get our bread at the peril of our lives because of the sword in the wilderness. Our skin is black as an oven from the scorching heat of famine. Women are raped in Zion, virgins in the town of Judah. Princes are hung up by their hands. No respect is shown to the elders. Young men are compelled to grind and boys stagger under loads of wood. The old men have lift, left the city gates, the young men their music. The joy of our hearts has ceased. Our dancing has been turned to mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. Because of this, our hearts are sick. Because of these things, our eyes have grown dim. Because of Mount Zion, which lies desolate, jackals prowl over it. But you, O Lord, reign forever. Your throne endures to all generations. Why have you forgotten us completely? Why have you forsaken us these many days? Restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. Unless you have utterly rejected us and are angry with us beyond measure. Boy, guys, this person is conflicted. <laughs> New our days. New our days. Well, the ultimate reality that the poet realizes is that even if God is the one who brought all this on us, there's only one person, there's only one who's going to get us out of this, and that's God. And so we have nowhere else to turn, though we know this may be because of our sin. We know that this may because, be because of what we've done. We still haven't got any other place to go. That's the, that's kind of the reality of people of faith. You know, ultimately when it all falls down, you still only have one place to go. And that's the person who you had faith in from the very beginning. Um, Maybe that's what the church 
the church. Anyone who claims the name of Jesus as Lord and Savior and uh, prays the Lord's Prayer uh, should plea for mercy and uh, grace and a restoration of community in this country. That's what we should do instead of just whacking away at each other every day. Saying we're right, no, we're right. You're wrong, you're wrong. <clears throat> you know, what? Uh, what is it saying to us today? Oh, well, that's what I was gonna ask. What is it saying to us today? Our faith is being tested because of our actions, but we have to keep our faith in order to correct our actions. That is certainly a powerful way to hear this message. That, um, you know, we have, uh, the world we live in is in part the responsibility of all of us. If we are broken and hurting, you know, we are the ones who help create the reality we live in. But we know also because of our brokenness, because of our sinfulness, the only one who can get us out of this mess <laughs> is God. And you know, we're not going to do this on our own. So we seek God's salvation. But, but, you know, according to Lamentations, though, but what does that require of us then? Belief. Okay, belief for one thing. We have to trust that God's going to do this, even though we certainly can't see that going on around us. We trust that God is... We have to work on ourselves. We have to do something different. <laughs> Part of confession isn't just saying, I'm sorry, and then going out and doing the same thing. If you do that, you're going to end up in the same place. <laughs> so... It's about turning around. So, you know, part of this is also saying, we're sorry, we realize we've done this. Help us be something new. Help us do something new. Help us act differently than we've acted. Um, right. There's that cry that's a part of this. We need to sing, a mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ill prevailing. Yeah, but Martin Luther wasn't around at this time. No, but uh, we need him. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you know, and one of the things God too, reads, think, it says here, you know, I think one of the things that we forget is that, in some ways, realities are always the same. So in Luther's day, they weren't sacked by the Babylonians. But there was a 30 year war going on and people were being killed right and left as they fought over where was, where was Catholicism, where was Protestantism. The devastation was incredible at that point in time. Shortly after that, you had the Black Plague, which wiped out, you know, what was it, three quarters of Europe or something like that. So the reality of what they're facing in in um, Lamentations, as I said, even now, it's a part of the human condition, war, destruction, evil, divisiveness, all these things that go on and on. It's probably one of the things that makes me cry out most to God. Why? Why, why is it, aren't things getting any better? Why aren't we ever learning anything new? <laughs> why are we just repeating the same mistake over and over and over and over and over again? That, oh, that was just uh, that was just my thing saying that I had a text message. It's oh, my text. We got one. We got one. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it says, um, well, "What about second breakfast?" It's from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know, it, it, the reality of lamentations is a reality in every age of Christian life. This kind of painful realization of the destructions and, and brokenness of the world around us. We may not be in as bad a shape in some ways as people here where you're starving to death, you have no food, your children are dying. In some places in the world though, that's exactly what's happening. Um, we may not personally be in the face of that, but again, we cry out in pain about this reality. What in the world is going on? 
And this forces us into asking some really important questions. And I, I, we're not going to get to answer all these. These are just the questions Lamentations leaves you with by the time you get to the end of it. The first is, what is the relationship between sin and bad things that happen? Um, certainly the person who writes Revelation sees it as kind of, you know, if we do bad things, God punishes us. That's the way it works. Um, we've all talked about we're not really comfortable with that as the explanation we would probably. But are we responsible sometimes for the brokenness of the world? Yes, we are. Do we bring it on ourselves sometimes? Yes, we do. Um, and so we do have to come to grips with the fact that um, sin, our brokenness, our evil in the world, has consequences, you know, for us. Now, I don't think God sits up in heaven and pushes buttons to decide who's going to get it today because of what they did. I don't think it's that simple or that, you know, straightforward. But I do think that there are questions here of realizing that the state we find ourselves in is of our own making. You know, we do have to come to grips with that to a certain extent and ask ourselves, what does that mean? Um, another piece of what you find in Revelations is, and I'm just going to read this um, from, from one of the books that I was working with and getting ready for this, because I think it's a really interesting way to phrase it. They wrote, another issue raised by Lamentations is the hiddenness of the real culprits in a disaster. Is it the tornado or flood? Or is it a weakening climactic system caused by human intervention? Or is it caused by unseen divine forces? The theological notion in play is that God is the cause of all that happens, both good and bad. We might ask ourselves, what are our images of God? Where did they come from? And why do they continue? Why do we blame God when humans have clearly created a disaster? Is God the scapegoat for humans? Or are humans the scapegoat for the actions of God? Um, where, do, where do the things come from? How much control do we have? Who are the real culprits? Why is this all happening? Lamentations is a five-chapter kind of struggle <laughs> with that question. Not clear what the answers are by the time you get to the end of Lamentations. But it continues in us. Who, who's responsible for what's happening? And to what level? Am I? Are my leaders? Is God? Everybody will come to their own understandings of that reality. Um, the next is uh, some Western communities have moved away from rituals of mourning altogether. Even after a death, rituals celebrating a person's life have taken their place. We talked about that a little earlier. Is this a move, is this a move in a healthier direction? Or is this a way to distance oneself from the pain of loss? How do we honestly face the pain of the world? How do we honestly face the losses of our life? How do we do it in a healthy way? What's going to bring us new possibilities? Um, I think those are all important questions that kind of come out of the struggle that Lamentations is. And Lamentations and Truth is, really is a struggle. You know, the person isn't giving us answers. They're not. It's a cry of pain and uncertainty in the midst of a broken world. And I think it's a cry that all of us have about the brokenness of the world. And one final thing that I want, I hope people will think about it a little bit is, um, is these are, this actually is from the book I've kind of quoted throughout, uh, God and the Pandemic. And it's not directly what's in Lamentations, but it is, I think, an offshoot of what's there. The author of that book, N.T. Wright, writes at one point, Yet lamentation cannot be an excuse for doing nothing. <laughs> Out of lament must come fresh action. At the very end, he's now talking about the pandemic that's going right on right now because he talked about lamentation in, in context of that. At the very least, clergy must be allowed to attend the sick and dying. 
If, as sometimes seems to be the case, secular doctors suppose that such ministry is superfluous, this must be challenged at every level. As we thank God that in the last two or three centuries, the long-term calling of the church to bring healing and hope has been shared in the wider secular world, we must work with the medical profession, not least to ensure a fully rounded, fully human approach. This applies particularly when people are near the point of death. The hospice movement of the last 50 years has been largely a Christian innovation. Privately funded, witness to a hope that secular medicine has sometimes ignored. The call of Jesus followers then, as they confront their own doubts and those of the world through tears and from behind locked doors, is to be sign producers for God's kingdom. So in the midst of these difficult times, we are to be the light that God shows into the world. We are to set up signposts, actions, symbols, not just words, which speak like Jesus' signs of new creation, of healing for the sick, of food for the hungry, and so on. This means things like running food banks, working in homeless shelters, volunteering to help those visiting relatives in prison, and so on. These can be rewarding tasks, but they, and all similar things, are also demanding. For them, we will need, as the disciples in the upper room needed, the living presence of Jesus and the powerful breath of his spirit. That's what we're promised. In following this vocation, we will therefore be doing what Jesus told his followers in John 16 to do in the power of the spirit. We will be holding the world to account. Just as the Jesus followers were showing the officials of the Roman Empire that there was a different way to run society, so there will be signs of God's kingdom that can emerge from the creative, healing, restorative work of church members today. Situations and opportunities will vary. But out of the lament of God's people, new possibilities can and do emerge. As Jesus' followers today grieve in prayer at the heart of the world's pain, new vocations may emerge, both of healing and wisdom, and of holding up a mirror to those in power to show what has needed to be done. So what he argues at the end of the book is lamentation is incredibly important. We have to enter into the pain and struggles of the world, but ultimately it also needs to lead us to do something. (laughs) Whether that doing something is helping individuals who are being crushed by the realities of the world or challenging the powers of the world to change the realities so that a new possibility can enter the world. Both of those are part of what the church is about. You and Christy and the leadership of this church face that immediately. Day one, (laughs) what are we going to do? You are into lament instantly. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you for your leadership. Well, I hope this can be a place where one of my biggest hopes is that we can face the pain of the world together. And we can talk about what are the possibilities of things that we can do. And those aren't always going to be easy. And they're not always going to be everybody agreeing and lockstep where we're going. But if we can't, in this place, begin to ask those difficult questions, then I don't know where else in the world people are going to be able to. Because at least here, we have the assurance that we've all been united in Christ and that in our disagreement, we're all in Christ together. We're all going to, you know, we're, we've been bound by something important. So we can talk about these things and, and not lose our life together as community which is not something that seems always to be able to be done in the world around us. You know, it's like... <laughs> you, you, that is not a change for you. You've been doing that since I've been here, you know, obviously long before well, that. Well, we've been doing it sometimes well, you, sometimes less well, perfectly. But, you but, know, <laughs> but it had to carry on in a different context. You know, um, and it's probably heightened the awareness of the need for... Uh, I think this, this time period unity. of time, certainly, yeah, has called us all to realize that um, we need to stand together somehow in all this. 
because it's the problems that have come to face us uh, are ones that are too big to handle on our own anymore. They're, they're just too large. Um, you know, our bishop in letters that um, he's been writing for our synod recently talks about, you know, we're dealing with a series of pandemics, a pandemic of COVID-19, a pandemic of racism, a pandemic of political discord. Uh, you know, these things are just washing over us one after another. And, you know, we as the people of God have to pray deeply for the presence of God to keep us faithful and strong in the midst of this and continue to work to make our way through these periods um, in ways that are going to bring healing and life. And that, that that's not easy. It demands a lot of all of us. I mean, in one of his letters, I thought the bishop was really um, created or was really courageous when he talked about his own struggles with racism. That you know, he looks at his own staff. There's not a person of color on his staff, and it's something he didn't even really look at at first before you know this all breaking into our our reality in new ways. That there are there's language and ways of worship that we do that don't welcome people and what do we do about that how do we how do we face that we all have to look within ourselves and ask the questions you know where do i need to be healed where do i need to be um have my eyes open to new realities where do i need to be um acting to be that sign of new life in the, in the community around us and that's it's something that's demanding something from all of us. But I also find some incredible hope in that reality, that we do have the possibility to ask the question, to move in some different directions. We don't have to do the same old thing all the time. <laughs> we don't. Um, and I think we need to embrace that um, possibility within ourselves and within the world around us. And that means that we do have to do some work. We have to take some risks. You know, all that's part of the reality. But it all begins with, I think, and Lamentations is a powerful remind us, reminder of that for us to first see. You can't do anything about something you don't see. That's right. <laughs> First thing you have to do is recognize um, the painfulness, the brokenness of things so that we can work together as God's people. Um, the letters from the bishop, why don't you consider um, sending them out to us, the congregation? I did send one of them out in one of the newsletters. Always. Yeah, yeah. as they come out, I try to you know, let people know what's going on. Because I think it's important that we hear what our church leaders are saying. Even again, if we don't always agree with that, that's why. Um, that's why I've always thought it's important that as the church puts together new social statements that, you know, we, all, we usually take a couple of adult forms to say, okay, let's talk about what's being said in this social statement because it's, you know, we need to think about that and what the reality is. And, and um, yeah, it's a good point that we need to get those out there all the time. Yeah, and just make it like that's the only thing that comes up mm -hmm. to highlight that it's yeah. The bishop. It would be nice. Yeah. What book are we going to do next? Next week we start the book of Amos. Hmm. Not back of Lamentations. Uh, it's beyond Lamentations. It's in yeah. what's called the Minor Prophets. And uh, interestingly enough, you know why the Minor Prophets are called the Minor Prophets, right? Because they're shorter. <laughs> <laughs> That's really the only. The only reason they're called, not because they're lesser or unimportant, but they're they're shorter. <laughs> yes, Amos comes right after Joel. It's um, it's nine chapters long, um, and we will take four weeks to take a look at Amos. Amos is really a a powerful book about justice and Amos's view of reality, um, true worship is seeking justice in the world. It's not about going to church. It's not about giving your offering. It's about being people of justice. And so um, that's what 
Amos will strike out to do. And Amos is in a tough spot, and we'll talk more about it when we 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 start this next week. But Amos is lives in the southern kingdom in Judah, where he is a um, a keeper of sycamore trees. So he's basically a farmer. <laughs> and God sends him to the northern kingdom, to Israel, to be a prophet. So he's constantly be to- being told by the people up in the northern kingdom, just go home. <laughs> we don't need you outsiders coming up here and telling us what to do. Just go back to Judah and leave us alone in his where it is. Where came from. <laughs> yeah, that's basically it. <laughs> And he says, well, you know, but God sent me here, so I'm I'm sorry. Can't go back. (laughs) So um, he's, to me, Amos is just so fascinating because he just, he is so blatant in what he says to people. He doesn't pull any punches, doesn't make it kindly soft. Um, You know, the rich women, and we'll, again, put this all in context, but Rich women who are who seem not to care about what's going on in society he calls them the fat cows of Bashan. You fat cows of Bashan lay around on your bed drinking wine. <laughs> no wonder they wanted to go. Home. <laughs> yeah, he he wasn't the most pleasant of individuals, but he makes some really powerful statements about the reality, the importance of justice. Yeah. Um, and I think at this time, especially maybe in our culture, in our world, we need, again, that word that Amos brings of, of justice. He ends on a positive note. Yeah. I just, I look to the end. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good, <that's> good novel. <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Thank, thank you, you for being here. Thank you very much. Go ahead to Amos. Bye, Cindy. <laughs> Bye, Cindy. <laughs> Bye, Bill. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Hi and bye, all in one.